Today, we're going to talk about the metaverse. I believe the metaverse is the next chapter for the internet. Mark Zuckerberg's address on the future of the internet made very little sense to us. Whoa, we're floating in space? Uh -huh. But he was right about one thing. The future is going to be beyond anything we can imagine. The internet has drastically changed our lives, and it's about to happen again. It spans the globe like a super highway. It is called internet. So in this episode, we're going to talk about the future of the internet, what the metaverse is, and how that differs from Web3, NFTs, and all the other buzzwords that you've heard recently. Yes, well, it's very simple, really. And some of the opinions we have on this might be controversial. We're rarely controversial. In this episode, we also speak to Gary V, and there's a lot that creators can learn from what he's done. Yeah. Carl. Yeah. No, it's not okay. So, Colin, are we really going to be hanging out playing cards with a space crab? You can only hope, but I don't think so. Probably not. Probably not. Probably nothing. Maybe a space lobster. <laughs> Definitely not a space crab. All right, Mark, roll the intro. Thanks for having me on. All right, so first let's talk about what the metaverse is. It's basically like the internet going from 2D to 3D. So you mm -hmm. think about 2D, you've got a magazine, right? You're shopping okay. in a magazine, there's ads there. The 3D version of that would be walking through the mall. That's kind of what like the metaverse is. It's the internet rendered in this 3D virtual form that you can move throughout. You're gonna have a wardrobe of virtual clothes for different occasions, designed by different creators and from different apps and experiences. Now the metaverse already exists in some places, like gaming environments, Roblox, for example, that's, that's a version of the metaverse where people are creating avatars and interacting with a 3D world, even going to concerts, hanging out with friends, but it's still on a 2D screen. Like you're not actually wearing a headset and, and inside that environment yet. And what Mark is talking about is this next level, which is this 3D rendered world that we would exist in. Screens just can't convey the full range of human expression and connection. They can't deliver that deep feeling of presence. But the next version of the internet can. I have a hard time with the concept of the metaverse and, and specifically the way that Mark portrayed it. Imagine your best friend is at a concert somewhere across the world. What if you could be there with her? Because I look at that like concert situation and I'm like, am I going to tap into a headset and like be at a concert and talk to someone next to me and be dancing to the music? But you're actually just alone in your living room. That's terrifying to me. On the other side of that, let's say you're the woman at the concert. You're actually not talking to anyone. You're yeah. You just look like you're speaking into space. <laughs> yeah. And the person next to you is probably going to say, are you talking to me? After party passes? Yes. Or the three-on-three -three basketball situation. Maybe you'll get some friends together for some three-on-three. -three. Maybe play pickup with people on the other side of the world. How does that work? I, have I don't no idea. What, what do I grab a basketball and and do it in my house? Yeah, like, make sure you have enough space. Yeah. I, I don't understand it, actually. I mean, it's it's somewhat akin to what we saw with The Matrix, in the early 2000s where you're like just sitting in a chair and you plug into this computer and now you have this new version of yourself that's interacting with the world. And when I watched that video, I found it very unlikely that there will be a scenario where I'm working in a virtual office. I'm working out mm -hmm. in a virtual gym. Where you're boxing like a robot monster. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then on top of that, I'm socializing in a virtual world. I don't know, at an after party with dinosaurs. This is wild. I have to take a hard look at myself and be like, am I just old? Am yeah, I the old you, guy? And, and yeah, you are. Am I the old guy who's looking at this and being like, oh, please. But I have a hard time imagining people wearing a VR headset or whatever would be necessary to actually engage with this world. And I think it's a terrifying future because it's very lonely and isolating. I know that the concept is actually the inverse, is to say we can live in a more connected world. This isn't about spending more time on screens. It's about making the time that we already spend better. But it felt very dystopian, this presentation. Yeah. In a way, we are living in a world that is the matrix where we are plugged into these computers. I have a, an identity that I curate here that has its own version of itself that, that it can engage with the internet. But also the office, you know, when Dwight started a second life. Playing that game again? Second Life is not a game. It is a multi-user virtual environment. It doesn't have points or scores. It doesn't have winners or losers. Oh, it has losers. And then he started a second Second Life. Right. For those people who want to be removed even further from reality. And then Jim created a Second Life and 
jokingly made it, but he actually enjoyed it. He looks a lot like you. Yep. Oh, there definitely are losers. <laughs> oh, there's losers. So one of the interesting things is that there will be more creators in the metaverse. Like what Mark is engaging with, you know, the house that he's in, the environments that he's in, the clothes that he wears. Like those are created by metaverse creators. Who made this place? It's <laughs> awesome. It's from a creator I met in LA. People who are coding and, and crafting things that you can interact with in the metaverse. I mean, there will be creators and people who are building experiences and products for this digital world. Right now, we have over 600,000 creators in our community. So overall, Mark's version of the metaverse I'm pretty skeptical about it, especially like when the people are at an after party with dinosaurs. That's weird. That was just too much. That yeah, yeah, to each his own. Mm, okay. Mm, All right. That, okay. I'll get I, it. That one I'm, felt like too much to me. I'm with you. I'm yeah. with you. Okay. There was one moment though where Mark hints at where the internet is actually heading. Now this is going to require not just technical work, like some of the important projects that are going on around crypto and NFTs in the community now. It's also going to take ecosystem building, norm setting, and new forms of governance. And so in that clip, he's talking about NFTs and crypto and this term Web3. Now that includes blockchain technology and basically the tech that will provide the infrastructure for the metaverse and power this next evolution of the internet. I just said a lot there. Colin said a lot. And if you're and overwhelmed, I, as am I. I think we should take a big step back. <laughs> Let's take a big step back. Let's define some Because I was even overreaching yes. my own boundaries sure. there. Let's start with Web3. Because Web is a word I can understand. <laughs> the World Wide Web, Colin. Yes, the World Wide Web, the internet. An online network called internet. Now, the first iteration of the web is Web 1.0. This is where we have web pages where you can go and intake information, and that's where that ends. For any of our viewers who have access to internet, we invite your comments. Web 2, which is what we have now, is where users get information from web pages and platforms, but platforms and pages also get information about us as users. They're collecting tons of data, and they're then selling that data to advertisers. That's the current world of the internet we live in. Like right now? Yes. On YouTube, you are watching this, and YouTube and Google are collecting data about you. To then sell to advertisers. And in this world of Web2, we use traditional currencies to, to buy things and, and transact. Now in Web3, all of this information and this data is given back to the individual users. Because with blockchain technology, there is now a way to represent ownership digitally mm -hmm. and to store things in a decentralized way where no one person or company has ownership over them. That was pretty good. You did it. You did it. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense to me, but granted, we're in these conversations a lot. Basically, like in Web3, ownership is something that can actually be represented today. And ownership across just all facets of time has mattered. And so actually being able to represent that ownership, own your own data, own your own things, pieces of art, collectibles. Oh, there's swag. And we were very skeptical, especially about NBA Top Shot. When I started seeing NBA Top Shot, these moments in time that were being clipped and sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars as NFTs, I was like, what are we talking about? This is like selling air. Like you can just screen record it and you own it. But that's actually not true. You don't own it. The same way that when we were actually in the car with Gary V, he opened up the window, took a photo of a building and said, I own that building. And he said, it's actually more muddy if I own that building or not. It's actually more likely for me to be able to claim that I own that building and you're not sure than me saying- Than if I owned an NFT or not. Which I can check in one second and know. Yeah. And that actually really helped me think through how this ownership structure makes sense in Web3 and how verifiable it is that you own something. So NFTs are just that module, that housing unit to show that you own something, to link something to the mm -hmm. blockchain. For me, though, the one thing that keeps me from going all in right now yeah. on Web3 is just the rate of adoption. Mm -hmm. It is very difficult. There's a lot of vocabulary. There's a lot of terminology. Yeah. I think that's the barrier that people are going to have to get over. Now, th there are people who are making this more accessible, and I think that's really cool. And one of those is the sponsor of this episode, Shopify. They helped the Chicago Bulls create an NFT marketplace where you could actually transact with credit cards. The Bulls NFT collection sold out in 90 minutes, which really shows you how easy it was for the Bulls to use Shopify to launch this marketplace. 
Now Shopify is empowering even more creators to sell NFTs through their storefronts. And I think that's really important that the on-ramp to crypto is in a more familiar environment like a Shopify store. We used Shopify to launch our published merch earlier this year. And here's a fun fact. Every 28 seconds, a new entrepreneur gets their first sale on Shopify. So make sure to head to shopify.com slash Colin and Samir. The link is in our description. They're definitely on the cutting edge of what's happening in the future of the internet and commerce. And if you're an entrepreneur or a creator, you definitely should be using Shopify. To take it a step further in Web3, we're no longer just using traditional currencies like the dollar. You have new types of currencies that can do things money has never done before. So Ethereum is basically a codable currency where you can do things like smart contracts, where you can update it and it can act in certain ways where, you know, let's say I have an NFT, I'm the person who originated and designed that NFT, I sell it to you, you sell it to someone else. I could write into the smart contract that every time that NFT sells, a portion goes back to the original owner. And you can also update it too, like if, if it means new things to hold the NFT, mm -hmm. right? So if initially it means that I get access to a certain event and then you do another event, you can actually program that, okay, if you hold this NFT, this now happens too. And that's really more malleable and more representative of how the internet is changing, that it's not actually that fixed. If I'm like, here, now this is yours. You bought it, you do what you want with it. I have my own. Yeah, you have your own. Damn, not a good example. <laughs> but then like in two years from now, if I'm like anyone who bought my original thing, I also want to give them access to this thing. That can happen really easily. So why don't we look at a, a real example here, which is Gary V and his V Friends NFT project. Basically the way this worked, Gary V drew out and sketched a bunch of different characters. Each character represented a NFT that one person could buy. Mm -hmm. Now attached to that NFT are a bunch of digital and physical experiences, whether that's you know, an entrance to his VCon conferences, which are all about entrepreneurship for the next three or four years, or it's access to a discord that mm -hmm. you can interact with other members from the community. Or group calls. Mm -hmm. So it's group calls. So there's a utility where you buy the VFriend and in return you get, you know, certain access, certain perks and rewards for you can being play an ping pong with him. You yeah. can play basketball. There's all types of different things that all stem back to, you know, getting access to things with Gary and with the Gary V community. So we caught up with Gary in New York and actually got to ride with him in the car to one of his events and ask him a couple questions about V Friends and what he thinks about this whole future of the internet. Creators, I feel like a massive part of being a creator is you're opening the door and aggregating people like you and, and developing a community. With V Friends now, your community has an identity and like an opportunity to actually connect with each other and also you know, experience growth as you're experiencing growth. Yeah. Is, is that how you were thinking about V Friends? Because you like as a, a way to kind of bring your community together? You know, the biggest reason I did V Friends is I can always add to the smart contract. Mm -hmm. I have no fear. When I launch Empathy Wines, when I launch a sneaker, when I launch other things, I can do everything right with the best intent. But once it goes into the world, I can't fix it. I can refund you if it's a problem. All the things I've ever done in my whole life, always. With NFTs, I can add to the smart contract. But my real passion was to make the people that most believed in me win. Mm. I viewed my NFT project in a lot of ways as almost my IPO as a human. Yeah. That this was an opportunity for my community and for a lot of the creators, because I know how important this show is. You know, at some level, this becomes the opportunity where your community can participate with you yeah. if they believe in you. And it's kind of like being a band that totally. like plays small gigs, yeah. but then you go to stadiums and they get big and your original fans get upset. This was almost going to be the reverse. I mean, what's going on with Viewprints is insane. And so I viewed it as an opportunity for the most bought in to be the winners of my execution over the next four decades and that feels great that's a really interesting note that the comment you just made around like viewing it as almost your ipo i think that's really cool so how does some of that digital ownership turn into to manifest itself in like a physical experience like well i mean first of all it won't a lot of it won't have to i mean we're only a decade away from the metaverse really mattering yeah so you're just gonna be up in there with your shit and in the real world, however, the creator wants to. 
you know? I mean, obviously with Be Friends, like every token's an actual ticket to an actual physical conference that's gonna happen at Minnesota Vikings, US Bank Stadium, where like, it's, yeah. that's real. Mm -hmm. And a million other executions. What I loved about speaking with Gary is that even though this feels very complex, this whole world of Web3 and NFTs, it all comes back to the fact that he is a community leader and a creator. He's been creating on YouTube platforms pre-YouTube, and it doesn't matter which platform it is, he's gonna provide the same value, mm -hmm. whether that's, again, in the form of videos on YouTube or through his NFT project. It's that he will help you become a better entrepreneur. He, he talked about how VFriends was kind of like his IPO, which is really interesting, where you could buy into the Gary V brand by owning a VFriend and go along for the ride because he can update what happens to an NFT holder over the next four decades, as he mentioned, over the next 40 years, if you own this original V friend and there's a limited quantity, it can get increasingly more valuable over time, which is what we're seeing. Those are getting more and more valuable if people are trading them. And what he says about at the end about like the financial gain and what would, what would you say to people who, you know, think this is only for financial gain? It's interesting because he says, well, most of the things I've done in my life have been financially beneficial to me and my family. This is by far the biggest thing I've ever done that has been disproportionately beneficial to all the other people involved in it. It's a multiplayer experience where it, everyone who owns VFriends is in on this thing of trying to increase the value, trying to make it a better community, trying to make it cool to own VFriends. And his reputation is on the line. If yeah. it turns out that VFriends holds no value, yeah. that's a really bad look because mm -hmm. everyone who cares about him the most just lost. So big companies are getting involved in this world in Web3, right? They, they're understanding, A, there's like obviously a lot of commercial value that you keep hearing about. Oh, this sold for a million dollars. This did this, 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 right? And you hear all these big numbers. But I think it's also this opportunity to develop a deeper relationship and also a recognition that digital ownership matters because ownership matters. And Nike is an example of a company that is clearly starting to get into this. People found out through the patents that they've been filing around digital sneakers that they are very much prepping for the metaverse. But it's really interesting because how it works is like if you buy a certain pair of shoes, you get an NFT attached to it that is, again, verifiable on the internet that you are the owner of that exact shoe. That and digital shoe. That digital shoe. But you also have a physical version of the shoe, which I like. And then that shoe digitally you can wear in the metaverse. They've just like really spanned the, the whole world of us being able to have an identity and status that mirrors our real life and our physical life that goes into the metaverse. The reason I think this is all going to take off is because in Web 2, we've all been extremely concerned with how our digital lives look mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. what that representation looks like. Of course. We buy Nikes in real life a lot of times to post the picture and have ourselves wearing Nike in an Instagram post. So is it that far-fetched right. that in a digital world, we'll also want to be wearing Nikes if we feel like that's representative of our identity? If you're a huge Chicago Bulls fan mm -hmm. and you're Roman through the metaverse, you would pay good money yeah. to make sure that you are totally. representing that team mm -hmm. because it's part of your identity. I think when you think about digital status, it already shows up with like the blue check. Verified checks across social is this way to like elevate status for certain individuals. And that blue check on Instagram, like you know you feel something when you see someone with a blue check. I know I want it. I know. I know we don't I have know it. I know we don't have it, Colin. And that hurts, you know? Love to have it. Love to have that blue check. I think it's about time we get it. Mark, <laughs> <laughs> I don't see a future where people are wearing headsets in their homes and interacting with this 3D universe. I don't. I'm curious if you guys think that's a reality that like we will be wearing like VR headsets and engaging with each other through that. You know what was a crazy part of that? Huh. When... Mark Zuckerberg goes, or maybe you'll just think it. Even just make things happen by thinking about them. Oh, what was that? Maybe how, you'll how just think it. How far away from that are we? Is there a microchip in my head? What type of experiments are happening at Facebook right now? Yeah, that was wild. That was like a maybe new, that is coming. Maybe, that was maybe like we'll wear contacts yeah. and there'll be things in our ears that 
I have a hard time thinking about the hardware that's going to be needed to exist in the metaverse. But what I do believe, and especially as creators ourselves, I do believe we're going to develop deeper connections with our community. And I think that's going to happen through this Web3 future of the internet, where we can almost create these like micro cities, where it's like, we're not just making this content for all of you, we'd make it with all of you. And you could also benefit from how we are growing as a brand, because you're a part of it. That, to me, is the power of this web three and the future of the internet. And I think that can be done through NFTs, cryptocurrencies, and web three. Agreed. If this was all over your head, welcome to the future of the internet. McDonald's also released a McRib NFT. What does that give you? Probably discounts at McDonald's and early access to the McRib. That makes sense.